Good afternoon. Welcome to the FIG Securities webinar this afternoon, an individual corporate bond story. I have with me uh, Graham Bottrell, who is a FIG bond investor, has been for the last five years, and also the president of the Australian Investors Association. My name's Elizabeth Moran, and uh, the way that Graham came to us, or I first met Graham, was through the uh, Australian Investors Association maybe five or six years ago yes. even. It's quite a while, yes. wasn't it? Um, but just at the most recent national conference, Graham uh, gave a presentation about his um, investment in corporate bonds. And that's one of the things the association does. It has different members talking about their yes. investment <laughs> journeys. And uh, it was such a great pr presentation. I asked him if he would give it um, to our clients uh, today. So welcome, Graham. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, hello Liz, thank you very much for having me today. My pleasure being here. Uh, fantastic. So before we start, just a, a couple of um, housekeeping things really. On your screen you should see an orange arrow and a panel on the top right hand side. If you can't see that, click on the orange arrow and the panel will expand. And you'll see uh, about three quarters of the way down that panel there's a, a questions, an area where you can type in questions to us. So uh, we'll be answering questions um, possibly through the way through, but I might leave most of them today to, towards the end so Graham uh, can, can give his presentation because it's a different sort of a presentation. But, um, uh, and we will try and uh, answer your questions. Also, if there's parts you don't hear or want copies of the slides, we will make a copy of the broadcast available um, once, once we're finished. So uh, without further hesitation, Graham, thank you much, very much for joining us and I'll <laughs> hand over to you now. Thank you very much. All right, so let's get started here. Um, an individual corporate bond story. I guess this is just about my journey. I'm not saying it's a uh, disclaimer. I'm an amateur. <laughs> this is what we're going to talk about is um, how, how and why did I get interested in bonds? Um, what have my experience been? What have I done? And what have I learned? So the presentation is basically in three parts. There's a bit of an introduction <clears throat> about how I arrived at uh, getting interested in bonds. The next bit is uh, some results of bonds that I have bought and sold in the last two years, just going back a short while in history. And the third part is uh, the uh, current ones and what I've learned and uh, hopefully I've learned a lot through the way. So if we get started here, <coughs> why did I become interested in bonds, Liz? Well, the first answer to that is I wasn't interested in bonds. Um, in, in 2012 or thereabouts, I wanted to reduce my workload <clears throat> and start taking a bit of a pension from our self-managed fund and I needed to increase the return a bit. And we we're holding lots of cash because we'd sold out of all our equities in late October 07 before the global financial crisis and went to cash. Uh, holding lots of cash, rates were good, um, but then they started falling and I saw they were going to fall further. So what are we going to do with our money to get a decent return? So, <clears throat> okay, why not property or cash or, or equities? Well, I had a problem with that because cash returns are now almost negative or they are negative after inflation. Property, we've got in our mind enough allocation to property and everyone will have their own view about this. Um, We've got a nice home, um, that's a significant percentage of our total um, wealth and so I didn't want to have any more. I don't believe in owning one property and being exposed to one rogue tenant. Yes, so, and the <coughs> illiquidity if you need the cash oh, exactly. quickly, yes. Yeah, so I didn't want to go there and then that left equities and uh, I could see some risks ahead and my comment here is I didn't have 40 years to recover a serious loss because that was not going to happen. So <clears throat> what was the risk that I saw? Okay. There were three influences here. There's, uh, and you might have seen on my CV that I'm interested in technical analysis. Uh, a bit of a nerd if you like on technicals. So that brings me to Elliott Wave and GAM and then not technical, but Benjamin Graham. So if we look at these influences, um, Elliott Wave Theory, um, Ralph Nelson Elliott 
says that the market moves in five waves. And if we look here, we've got one to five and the 0.5 up the top there would represent November 2007, <coughs> which was the high in the ASX 200. And then after that, Elliot says we have a three wave correction, ABC corrective. Okay, so if we apply that to the ASX 200, from 2nd of November 07, which you can see on the top left over there, down to March 09, and then across to wave B, and then something down from there to who knows where. So I thought, oh, that's not pretty. <laughs> no, no, we're waiting for that clip. Yeah. That's not pretty. So, okay, <clears throat> then if we look at GAN, another um, technician in charting and whatever else, but GAN's methods are based on biblical package, uh, passages. And it's basically what is has been and what will be has been. So GAN's saying patterns repeat. So if we apply GAN theory to the ASX 200 from the time, <clears throat> we've got the range down from 2nd of November 07 to the uh, March 09. And GAN says that range will be repeated or likely to be repeated at some stage in the future. So if we're up here around about the 6,000 point, and GAN says, um, you know, watch out for a range down of 3,683 points, which is the same as a range down back from November to March. Well, that's a bit scary as well. That's a lot scary. <laughs> so I thought, ah, not too comfortable with that. And then I started to read Benjamin Graham because i have been hearing some speakers mention Benjamin Graham and his book called The Intelligent Investor. And I thought, I heard it about three times, and I thought, oh, someone's trying to tell me something, I should read this. And I discovered that Benjamin Graham says, recommend that the uh, investor hold never less than 25% or more than 75% in bonds uh, versus common stocks. I thought, oh, okay, um, this guy's got some credentials because he was mentor to Warren Buffett, et cetera, et cetera. I should take some notice. <clears throat> so. Let's see what this uh, bond story is, what returns are possible, how does it work, and that sort of thing. So research follow. Now, here's a Vanguard chart from the UK with an example of potential returns and potential losses with a portfolio comprising bonds and stocks. And if you see on the left-hand side, it's got 100% stocks. And it's saying you could expect the highest gain in the year of 54% and the worst loss of 43. And then if you go across to the right hand side of that chart, you can see that if you have 100% bonds, you're only going to make a maximum of 32% in a, in, a, in a fantastic year, not 54. But you can only expect a loss of maybe eight instead of 43. And if you go somewhere in the middle, then you're expected gain is reduced a bit, but your expected loss or potential loss is reduced by a larger amount. I thought, oh, that's pretty interesting. There's a bit of safety in there. And as I said, I can't afford a 40, I haven't got 40 years to make up a loss. So I thought, it's pretty good. So if we move on, and there's another Vanguard chart um, that's proposing in a moderate portfolio, 50% equities in the middle there, 45% bonds and 5% cash. For those adventurous souls, go to 80% equities, but still have 20% bonds. And okay, more of the story, this is good. So what's the history of the performance of equities versus bonds over the last few years? So did some more research and came up with another Vanguard UK chart. <coughs> and this is based on indices. And so it's not actual bonds, um, but it's, you know, averages, so it's got some meaning. And if we look at these, we can see that, um, I'll actually go to the next slide. Bonds have the highest return in four of 21 years, but the bonds return is greater than equities in seven out of 21 years. So, okay, the bonds didn't win more than four out of 21, but they did better than equities in one third of the number of years. So, ah, oh, that's worth taking notice of. That's, that's good. 
So then we looked at equities one in five out of 21, which was really only one more year than bonds won. So that's pretty impressive too. And property wins in 11 out of 21. Well, us Australians in Melbourne and Brisbane and Sydney can probably you know, <laughs> uh, be happy about the property thing going at the moment. Uh, and cash won just in one year, which is probably what we could expect. Now, when property won, it won big, really big. Um, equities are all over the place and bonds have given a reasonably consistent return, even though it's often not the best return. So I was starting to feel comfortable at this point. Okay. Excellent. So what types of bonds? And if you're a, a FIG client, and you would be if you're listening to this, then you probably know all this. Uh, fixed rate, floating rate, inflation linked, and annuity or index annuity, and, and some variants of that, which is some that amortise, etc. So we can probably, well, fix is fixed, obviously. Floating is usually based on the bank bill swap rate, often the three month, I think. That's right. Yep. Yes, that's right. Um, inflation linked is some base rate plus the ABS inflation. Annuities, I have some because they were available but I'm not a great fan because I really don't need some of my capital back each time. Yeah. That just gives me a problem of finding another home for it. <laughs> <laughs> what a nice problem to have. Yeah. <laughs> um, bond prices. Now there's formula for calculating bond prices. I'm not going into that today, but it's basically the present value of the future interest payments plus the present value of the face value, which you get back at maturity. Um, but I'm not sure what use the formula is when the market determines the price anyway. So That's right. So when I'm considering um, a bond, I'm, I'm looking at the, the coupon rate. Is that a reasonable return? I'm happy with that. The rating of the bond, if it is rated. The yield, which if I'm buying an, an offer, then the yield and the rate are the same. But if I'm buying an existing bond, the market is revalued up or down, then it will be different. Time to maturity, uh, potential calls. When is the, uh, when's the bond going to be called or potentially called and, and how often do I get paid? When's the next instalment and how often is that? All right, so moving on. <clears throat> so what did I do? Well, I started really slowly. Uh, I bought one. Uh, which was Sydney Airport back in 2012. Great. And uh, within a few months, it had uh, adjusted upwards. And uh, my fit guy said, oh, you've done pretty well out of this. Why don't you think about uh, moving from A to B? I can't remember what the suggested uh, alternative was. I said, yeah, okay, that sounds reasonable. And I made money on the bond price. And I had no idea. I thought I was just buying a coupon. So there you go. Mm -hmm. All right, so experiences. <clears throat> um, these are some that I've bought and sold in the last two years or so. I haven't gone right back to 2012, but just some of the recent ones. So SCT Logistics, um, it's a rail um, freight operator. They have a bit of a stranglehold on the east-west rail link from Sydney to Perth. They're pretty big in the north-south uh, area. They're building a, um, an interchange uh, thing, I think, at um, parks or somewhere like that where the yes. rails are going to cross over. Yes, they actually ship like high consumables or high consumables, so right. Woolworths <coughs> type groceries okay. and alcoholic beverages and things. Um, so they have, and they have some very big, large uh, and consistent contracts yeah. over many years. So quite a nice, stable infrastructure-based type mm. business, yeah. Well, that's good. Um, the uh, You can see I, I only held that for sort of five months from June 15 to November 15. Uh, the um, SCT issue from FIG was you took the fixed and the floating to participate in the deal, and I was happy with that. And then there was a good offer for the fixed and I've kept the floating. I think I've still got it today. Um, and the market valued that from 100 to 103.6 in four and a half months. And I thought that was a pretty good offer. And I thought that was likely fully valued. Mm -hmm. So I 
decided to bail out. Now, <clears throat> this screen for the people listening and looking, this is just a uh, screen dump from an Excel spreadsheet, and I've got dozens of these in Excel. It takes the purchase price at the top there, it's got the sale price at the bottom, it's got the difference, which in this case is a nice profit on the bond price. Um, in the next column to the right, there's coupon interest, and you can see I didn't stay long enough to actually receive any interest on this one. Mm. <laughs> so the total return was $1,800, which is 3.65% of my 50,000 investment, held for 135 days, so annualised, that's 9.86%. So the way this spreadsheet works is that 135 days calculator on the second last column there is just doing an Excel calculation between the two dates, the purchase date and the sold date, and then doing the annualised thing by multiplying 365 by 135 over 365 days. So hopefully people can follow that. Do you think that's enough explanation? I think I think that's pretty good. I think okay. people should be able to follow that. So 9.86%, happy with that. Next one, G8 Education. People would know these early learning centres people. Um, purchased in August 13, sold in January 16, um, profit of 2,700 on the bond price, uh, four interest receipts on coupons there, total return of $10,000 on the 50 over that time, um, that's 20%, but annualised 8.47. And that was sold to fund a new issue. I had no um, particular desire to sell that one, but uh, there was another opportunity and I needed to pick something to sell. And, <laughs> and, that, and, and you've got a nice um, hmm. uh, profit from that one as well. While we're talking, um, David has just um, asked, wants to ask, what were the costs involved with buying these bonds? Uh, I have no idea what FIG charges for brokerage because it's incorporated in the buy and sell price. And um, this is very different to equities because those of us that trade equities know that our contract note has the brokerage on there. We look at that and think, oh, that's a lot of money or whatever. And uh, it's a bit different in bonds because you don't see that. And I've been asked before, well, don't I have a problem with that? Well, no, I actually don't. Because if I go to the car dealer to buy a new car, I know he's making a margin and I don't know what that margin is, nor do I care because if the price of the car is attractive, I'll buy it. So the same thing here with the, the bond, um, I'm offered a, a price to buy or sell which includes whatever the margin, whatever the brokerage is built in there. But if I'm happy with the overall price, then I do the deal. Yes. Um, yeah. I don't know whether people find that strange or not. But. Well, um, it's really how the market works too. It's a globe, that's how the global market works. And I'll, actually a lot of the bonds uh, Graham's talking about, he's bought at first issue. Yes. So <clears throat> uh, there is no brokerage, although we are paid a commission on behalf of the company the issuing issue. um, the bond. So, uh, yeah, we do get paid. It's, I think generally I would say to people, it's generally about 1%. It can be more and it can be less than that, depending on many factors, including how big the issue is, how hard it is for us to source the bonds. Um, we very much are the middle man, if you like. We match buyers and sellers. So if we've got a lot of, uh, or if we've got the bonds for sale already, um, we don't have to source them or it's a very big liquid issue, it's easy for us to find them, it might be less. Uh, equally, the amount investors have invested with us, so very large investors will get much better rates mm -hmm. and smaller investors will pay a bit more than, than the bigger investors. So mm -hmm. it, um, like anything, it, it varies. So, yeah. But I think about a 1% I think is, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. is fair enough. Um, a couple of other questions while we're on questions. Yep. Russell has asked, um, have you applied your Elliott Wave and GAN analysis to a long-term bond value return chart? No, I'm not sure that um, there's any real point in that. Um, I suppose you could technically argue that there is, but um, I think the technical analysis thing works best really long term, or does for me anyway. Um, I find it very difficult to apply GAN or Elliott Wave in a short period of time, like a few months or something less than a year or maybe 18 months. 
um, it, it always uh, is clearer to me when I'm looking at GAN charts or Elliott charts if it's five or 10 or 20 years. And I don't sort of um, have a, a strategy of holding bonds for five or 10 or 20 years, so I've never done the technical sort of thing on it. Well, it's sort of slightly different, isn't it? Because mm. the bond has a maturity date. Yeah. And if it continues to survive, it's so you're going to get your money back. Yeah. So you sort of always know yeah. what the, the um, best case or the expected case is. Mm. I mean, the worst <laughs> case is the company goes belly up and it goes into a wind up and you're not sure of what you're going to get. Uh, however, Moody's have done an analysis of all rated bonds that they've rated and mm. any companies that have gone into uh, like a wind up investors on average still get back 40% of their capital. So, but it's not the, it's a sort of a different yeah, dynamic to yeah, the market perhaps. Yeah. It's a reasonable question. I've never sort of thought that um, there was any benefit in me doing that. No, no, <laughs> well, no. Um, uh, a couple of other just quick questions yes. while we're here asking questions. Uh, Max wants to know about the costs applying to the secondary market of bonds. Yes, I'd still use about a 1% roughly uh, cost um, brokerage uh, charge if you like yeah. again it could be more or less than that we do if you do become a fig client or are a fig client you would know that there are um, custodial fees so clients um, need to open an account to transact mm -hmm. and we need to um, provide a custodian and our custodian is JP Morgan and they charge us fees so yeah. uh, we we charge a fee for um, account keeping purposes and it starts at 0 0.2 of a percent. Um, and, and nobody likes fees, but some no. of them are inevitable. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly, this is true. I might let you keep going, Graeme. Okay, well, we'll move on next slide. Um, Fortescue, FMG Resources. Now, this was a US dollar bond. And look, I confess right here, I have never had a huge amount of success with US rated bonds. I always seem, to pick the wrong side of the currency battle. Uh, maybe that's just my luck, but uh, currency never seems to go the way I thought it was going to go. So this one was bought in January 15, which is a while ago now, um, and uh, it was $50,000 in US, so 59 in, in Australia. Uh, sold in March 16, and it was struggling because of the currency. But again, there was a new issue coming, so I needed to sell something. Suddenly, um, Fortescue had a, a report where they uh, trimmed their costs uh, considerably. They started making a profit and uh, the, uh, the bond market suddenly went up a bit and I saw that as an opportunity to bail. Uh. Yes, well that's the thing isn't it with foreign currency <clears throat> bonds, it's not just the credit risk of the company that you're exposing yourself to, it is the, the currency as well, unless you already hold US dollars yeah. or sterling or... Yeah. Uh, so you do have to factor that in. And I don't like playing two games at the same time, but <laughs> sometimes you have to. Anyway, 12.4%, happy with that. Why am I complaining? Mm -hmm. um, La Trobe Financial, uh, seemed like it would never perform to me. I mean, this is one of the low ones. You'll see 4.7% annualised on the bottom right-hand side there. I actually lost a little bit of money on the bond price and made a bit more on the coupon interest. So, um, you know, it, I, I just looked at this month after month after month and I held it for, you know, a year. And I thought, ah, not happy, let's go. I think that's a good way to, to approach it too. If you're not happy or things aren't looking as good, there's possibly yeah. something better out there. And, uh, yes, yeah, so that, that was a residential mortgage-backed security, that mm. one, which do... do they do pay principal and interest back. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, as you can see, it uh, pays monthly, which is quite attractive to, to yeah. some investors. Yeah. And uh, residential mortgage-backed securities are actually one of the things we've been recommending now because most of them are investment grade, so low risk, yep. uh, but you can see higher returns. Uh, equally, they have like a capital structure diagram. I'm hoping you understand what I'm talking about there. But they have different tranches, so you can choose your risk yeah. um, in in those uh, yeah. tra tranches. If this was the E, as you can see. Yeah, yeah. So you were down the list a bit. You're yeah. in a higher risk one. Yeah. So. But yeah. even so, I mean, it was meant to be sort of around about eight percent, and I got four. So. Yes. Yeah, anyway. That didn't work out. No. Sometimes. 
Newcrest, another US dollar. Um, again, I've said here probably a mistake taking US dollars because I don't seem to be able to win that game, but that's all right. Um, it paid me 5% over about 18 months. So who's complaining? <laughs> well, 5% is pretty good. Can I just answer a question there from Malcolm who's just typed in, is there an opportunity for retail investors to purchase US dollar denominated bonds? Unfortunately, Malcolm, no there isn't. Um, you must qualify as a wholesale investor to do that, uh, to invest in residential mortgage-backed securities and US dollar denominated bonds. And to do that, uh, you need to have a net of $2.5 million under your control or have earned $250,000 gross for the last two consecutive years. And we need an accountant's um, letter to, to state that. So unfortunately, not at, not at this time. No. Okay. CML Group, <clears throat> factoring and payroll and whatever. Um, bought at issue, March 16, held it for just eight months. It seemed to be fully valued. If you look at the, the price there of 51,600, that's 103 basically. Um, <clears throat> and I thought, yeah, that's probably as high as that's gonna go. And I guess there was another opportunity somewhere, so I sold that one. This is starting to look pretty interesting though with the return. You can see there's $1,600 gain on the bond price, 2,600 in interest over the time. 12.75% uh, return. That's higher than I would have dreamt. Yes. So happy with that. Uh, just a very quick question from Steve. He's wanting to know if your spreadsheet um, brings each coupon down to a net present value or does it just okay. take the total coupon? It's, kind of, it's very simplistic and I know it's simplistic. Um, it, it could be uh, have all sorts of more sophisticated calculations in there. Um, at the end of the day, I think it's probably only going to make 0.1 or 0.2% on the return different anyway. So I'm looking at broadly um, answers rather than fine detail answers. And also, I guess, too, it depends on, you know, your, your spreadsheeting skills and the amount of time you want to put into it. And yeah. if you think you've earned about 12%, well, that's good enough, yeah, uh, I mean, or plus or minus. Or... If it's 11.9, I don't care. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Eric Insurance, uh, again, this was an original issue. Um, from July to February uh, earlier this year. And uh, it, it, it's an insurance company and the insurance companies have their fortunes, good and bad as the circumstances change. This is a, a smallish company, so I decided I'd keep it a bit short. Um, so I, I got out of there, you know, in uh, less than a year. I held it for 208 days, you'll see there. So, 9% is the total return, which equates to about 16 annualised. Again, we're starting to get some fairly high numbers. So, you know, people out there will be saying, whoa. Yeah, I <laughs> didn't think bonds could do that. <laughs> Newcastle Coal, um, <clears throat> this is a consortium of uh, coal companies that run the Newcastle Coal Terminal. This was a US denominated bond as well um, from March 15 to July this year. Again, currency, small loss on the currency. You can see I can't pick this currency um, gain, but enough uh, interest to get me out of trouble. So whereas the bond um, you know, was denominated 12.5%, I got eight after a bit of a loss on the currency, but 8% is not to be sneezed at, so. No. Happy with that. Cash converters. Had them fairly long time. You can see it goes back to September 2013 and would have been an original big issue. Um, sold in July, just uh, sorry, September just gone. Um, very small profit on the bond price. Quite happy with the coupon interest. 8% um, annualised return. There's maturity September next year. Uh, and the price at the moment is higher than the maturity price, obviously the 100. So I thought, oh, well, let's get out here, take a little bit of a profit while it's on the table. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, that's the ones that um, we've bought and sold in the last couple of years. If we look at the current holdings now, 
I'm still holding McPherson's. Now, I know Liz said a while ago she doesn't like McPherson's. Oh, I just, I'm, <laughs> I've been a retail analyst and I just never felt it was doing that well. To be to give the company credit, they've really uh, t changed things around and it's doing much better than when it, I think, than when it was first issued. So, yeah. yes, I've been happy, happy enough to hold it now. <laughs> McPherson's is a bit of a, you know, everything. They're in manicure, and I've got here Lady Jane, Swispers, Wiltshire, Stanley Rogers, Euromade. Um, you know, it's a real multifaceted business, and sometimes that's good and sometimes it's not. Um, from March 15, then I sold 20,000 um, of it back in uh, 16. And what I've done is um, done a calculation that's not shown on this page, but you'll see on the right-hand side in days held, uh, <clears throat> 376 days from the first sale of the part of it, and then 569 days for the balance. So I've actually calculated the annual return based on the amount of the capital that was applied for those two numbers of days. So it's actually doing a proper calculation, not down to the individual uh, interest though. So nine, around about 9% happy with that, I think. <clears throat> SCV Logistics, this is the floating rate note, which was issued at the same time as the fixed rate, which I showed you in the sales earlier. A um, little bit ahead on the bond price so far. Um, coupons are quite nice, and that's showing 7.4% currently. So the, these ones that I've held, these are all valued as at the end of October, which is now a couple of weeks ago, but it's the current numbers that I've used. So that's pottering along quite nicely. Integrated packaging. Uh, this is an interesting one, September 15 to October 17. So there's a couple of years there. Um, <clears throat> that's uh, annualized holding period return of 8.15%, but these will actually be redeemed tomorrow. Yes, <laughs> yes, about $40 million going back yeah. into investors' pockets. Yeah. And a um, bit of a bugger because we all have to find homes for that money now. Yes, <laughs> yes, there's a bit of a shortage of bonds. <laughs> so, um, okay, we're going to be tipped out of this uh, tomorrow, but um, we get 102 plus accrued interest, so I'm happy with that. That October valuation is about the price that it'll be redeemed at. So I'm happy with that. I'll get about 8% for my trouble. It's not a bad day's work. Right? No, it's all right. Mm. Um, Sunland Capital, uh, a property development mob, I think based by some Asian Hong Kong people or not sure. But anyway, um, there's, there's Asian money in there somewhere as well. Um, They've got a development just near where I live, up on the northern beaches of New South Wales. So I'm watching that with interest. The development was oh, probably 60 or 70 townhomes, and they were all sold the day of the release. Wow. Off the plan. Wow. That quick. Yeah. All sold the day mm. about three, mm. four months ago. Mm -hmm. So I thought, all right, I'm, doing all right, I'm happy to hold the bond a bit longer. Yes. <laughs> So we're considerably ahead on the bond price. You can see that's valued at about 106, mm -hmm. which is getting up there a bit and starts to let you think, ah, oh, maybe that's too high. Maybe it's going to come down from there and maybe I should sell. I haven't because there's nowhere else to put the money. <laughs> but 9.6% uh, annualised at the moment and uh, a payment due, I think, this week, November 17. That's all right. Impact Group, um, this is um, amortising approximately 2% each uh, coupon. Um, bought in February last year and the current valuation in October after the amortisation. We're a little bit ahead on the bond price, a few nice coupons and a annualised return so far of 11%. So again, happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> I might just ask a couple of questions. I've got a couple uh, regarding the portfolio. Um, John asks, do you mainly only buy the new issues? I love to buy new issues if I can get them. Um, and if they're available and they come through the FIG new issue pipeline, then I'm always uh, keen. And I haven't seen one that I've rejected, um, certainly not recently. 
Um, but sometimes you buy outside the new issues. For instance, I was chasing Next DC for a while. I'll talk about Next DC in, in a little while. Um, and uh, I wasn't able to get their original bond. And uh, there was a, another one issued not so long ago. And uh, my fig guy was able to get me um, some of that. And I would like some more of that. So the problem with those is the market's already valued it up. <laughs> Yeah, that's and, been the case, hasn't it? Yeah. That anything that we've bought to market pretty well has traded up and yeah. delivered uh, good yeah. returns. Yeah. So hence the, um, the keenness in acquiring a new issue if they're available. But alas, they're not always. And um, uh, Max has asked, there appears to be a, a trading approach to your investment as opposed to a passive investment like uh, approach, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, that's right. I, I would call it active investment. Um, I I have this um, thing in my head that says trading is more speculative than investing and I probably, you know, and the world outside listening to this might disagree with me and they might be laughing now, that's fine. But I think it's active management rather than trading. Um, but I, I don't really mind which name you apply to it. Um, it's not a set and forget uh, idea. Um, I'm not buying highly rated bonds that I feel I can leave for a year and come back and they'll still be there. I'm pushing the boundaries a little bit. And so I think you have to be active and, and manage that a little more closely. Um, That's great. I, I, I sort of, it sort of ties in with a question from Graham. Hello, Graham. Nice to have you on the um, line here today. And this is a different Graham that I know quite well. He says uh, to the Graham sitting next to me, um, you said you don't want capital back from annuities as it gives you a, a reinvestment problem. So why do you bother selling your bonds? Why not just enjoy holding them to maturity, especially one like Sydney Airport, which was a, a, a great credit and a hedge against inflation? Well, that's a good question, but if if a bond has gone from 100 to 102 or 103 in six months, my view is it's not likely to double again in the next six months because the market's assessed it and valued it at what the market is. And unless interest rates change, the bond price is not going to change. And FIG's pipeline is occasionally offering me new issues. So a lot of the time I sell something to fund a new issue. Mm -hmm. Or I'm concerned that, um, yeah, there's a call coming up and I really would rather take the price that's offered to me now rather than take the call price. I don't know whether that's a good answer. but No, I think that's good. And it actually just, again, plays into another question from David who asked very early. You suggested that determining the value is not worth it as the market determines value. And I think both of us sort of would say that um, we look at yields, we look at what interest rates are doing, um, we look at what competitors are doing, what similarly rated bonds are doing or what companies in the same sector are doing. There's a lot of things that we might assess um, as opposed to looking at um, net present values of, of yeah. coupons yeah. and um, and capital at maturity, so it's a sort of it's a different way of looking at things. But um, there's a lot of sort of indicators out there that we might use to judge whether it's good value or not. And just simply the coupon on any given day, if you're getting a six percent coupon today, um, if I was showing an investor that, I would say this is a high yield bond. Understand there are mm. high risks with this. Mm. You do need to keep an eye on it. Mm. And here are your risks, whatever they are, and yeah. might try and list a few for yeah. the person. Yeah. Uh, but then if I was showing uh, another bond with 3.5%, that would likely be investment grade, yeah. uh, much lower risk, something you could set and forget and hold to maturity with a, a much greater... Uh, at a much greater comfort level. So mm. it really depends on, I think, finding your tolerance for risk and the amount of work you want to do. And uh, mm. well, do you think that's fair, Graham? Oh, any other comments? I mean, it, it's a case of um, part of it is I enjoy the game, I suppose. Uh, a friend a friend of mine said to me oh, a couple of years ago, and I remember it, and he's way more wealthy than we are. And he said, oh, how much do you need? 
And I said, Terry, it's not about that. It's about the game. I enjoy the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not, isn't it? It's nice to walk away with a profit. Yeah. yeah. So, well, I made eleven percent on yeah. my on my bond, or right? my portfolio's made a double digit return this year. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and you know, typically people now, if they haven't heard about bonds or haven't read about them. They just think bonds are government bonds, paying 2%. And that's the problem because the commentators and, and the Alan Collars and those sort of people put bonds um, are this or bonds are that. And then you've got to delve in and see what are they actually talking about? Yes, and they're not always talking about what we're talking about. Mostly they might, they're not. Yes, US Treasuries <laughs> might be what they're talking about. Any let's keep going. On that? Okay. Yes, let's um, keep going. I think just, we just a couple a, more of these. Good amount of um, CF Asia Pacific, um, they're um, financing railway rolling stock and locomotives and that sort of thing. Um, Ten percent. I won't go through the individual details. People can see that for themselves. But uh, that was bought at the end of last year, so held it for almost a year now. A little bit of profit on the bond price, although it's amortising there as well, um, and some nice interest. So about ten percent. Happy with that. Uh, IMF Bentham litigation funding. Well, there always seems to be need for litigation funding, so I think they're probably going to be around a little while. Um, from April this year, so it's a relatively recent one to October. That's you know not quite six months, I suppose. Um, and uh, that wasn't an original issue. You can see I bought that in the market, or Fig sold it to me in the market. Um, bit of profit on the bond price. So when I looked at buying that, I thought 51, that's 102. It's 7.5%. It's senior secured. The market's likely to take it up a little bit higher from there, I thought. And it has. It's taken up to 106, if you like. Would you agree with that, Liz? I mean, would you have bought that at 51.47? I still like this bond. It's been <clears> one of my favourite bonds since it was first issued of right. the FIG originated bonds. Right. Um, I like the business. I think they're smart guys. Uh, I, I just, I'm, I like, I like yeah. this this particular <clears> bond. So yes, I even at um, the higher rate today, I'd still probably be a buyer of this bond. Um, I think it's a good risk return equation and. You know, the fact you've got a double digit return in a short period sort mm. of reinforces your decision to buy yeah. in the market at a higher yeah. price, doesn't yeah. it? Look at that and thought, mm, okay, I, I need a home for some money to be invested. But what about this? Yes, it's, it still seems reasonable. It still seems like a good deal. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. And 12. Mm -hmm. um, actually, let's go back to that. One other one that was I was going to mention, which is not on here, was Next DC. I think yes. we talked about. Yes, yeah, so, we did. Yeah. Um, I was able to get next DC. I don't have a slide of this, but uh, July this year, uh, and I paid fifty one thousand eight hundred for the bond. At the end of October, it was valued at fifty three thousand. So that's eleven hundred dollars profit on the bond price. I haven't received any interest yet because no. it hasn't come round. Mm. But I'm eight percent annualised ahead on next DC in. Well, I've got here 99 days. Yes. Um, so I think that was probably a reasonably good decision as well. Yes, I think, I'd, I'd say yes, looking at that. I think very definitely yes. Um, we've got a few questions. Do you have yeah, to take them now? Let's do them, yeah. So um, Alan asks, where do the current valuations come from given that the bonds are unlisted? So Alan, the current valuations come from our facilitation group. So they're the group within FIG that trade bonds. So they're buying and selling and they mark the prices of the bonds. Mm. So they uh, will adjust the prices according to supply and demand. If there's a, a significant demand and not enough supply, they'll push the prices up. Uh, and equally, if there's a lot of uh, bonds being offered for sale, they'll push the prices down. So it's uh, what we would term our own internal uh, mark on, on, the, on the bonds. Yeah. Um, Lars asks about what does amortisation of the bond mean? So an amortising bond means that um, it, it's repaying principal as it goes along. So it's you are reducing your exposure to the company each quarter or half year or month, it's repaying some principal to you. It's similar to annuity but different. Yes, it is similar to annuity but different. Um, Kim asks Graham, 
Are you concerned about the lack of liquidity in another crisis? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's one of those things that I don't really feel that there's any real alternative to doing anything about it. And um, <clears throat> the problem is I can't uh, see that I could sell all my bonds tomorrow and put it all in term deposits at 2%. Um, that's not going to cut it. So I think that I come back to the active management and watch it very closely um, and just uh, try and be sensible, be careful, uh, and probably, you know, I, I'm very interested in what the stock market's doing right now because, um, <clears throat> can I digress for a little yes, bit? Yes, of yeah. course, yes. Um, I said we sold all our equities in, October 2007 actually, we sold some before then, a few months before, we went to Europe for a holiday, we came back and we sold the rest. And I was following the GAN chart for 1987 and 1997 in 2007, so the 10-year and the 20-year chart. And 1987 and 1997 were pretty much an exact pattern match for 2007. So I was pretty confident that um, early November was going to be the high, and so we sold out. If you go forward another 10 years from 2007 to 2017, um, the patterns are not quite the same, but there are similarities. So is that pattern going to be repeated? I don't know, and I'm not making any predictions at all, but I'm seeing there's um, maybe a need for some caution. Probably leave it at that, I think. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, so John asks, what objective research material do you access to evaluate weight a potential bond purchase? Oh, look, I read all of the research that comes uh, with, the, with the new issues and, and there's uh, company research on existing issues as well. Um, but more than that, I like to have a gut feeling about the company. Now, I'll give you an example here, which comes to mind. A couple of years back, I was holding a bond called Plenary. Now, the Plenary Group is a um, project management, project directing company. And in my construction days, I worked on a project with Plenary. We built about $100 million worth of Defence Force housing on five or six Defence Force bases. And Plenary put the deal together. <clears throat> they employed the design consultants, they employed the contractor to build it, and they had people to maintain it for 20, 30, 40 years, whatever, afterwards. And they were a slick, professional, well-oiled machine. And so when their bond became available, I had no hesitation in purchasing a slice of that action because I knew how good they were. And my fig guy um, said a couple of times, oh, Graham, you've done well out of this bond. Why don't you sell? I said, no, I love this one. <laughs> <laughs> and it was about three or four times um, he tried and eventually I succumbed to my soul. And it was for the right reasons. But so I, I try and get a bit of a feeling for um, the company as well. And a bit like we talked about SCT earlier and the, looking at rail freight east, west and north, south, and the fact that they've got the stranglehold on the interchange in parks and all that sort of thing. And they go, this is a pretty sound business. What's the research say? Research was okay, so I went ahead. Yeah. Uh, our, our research is fairly <coughs> detailed on the new issues, typically sort of a 20-page report. Mm. We'll list strengths, but also risks, because yeah. we certainly want our investors to understand the risks of what they're investing in and, yeah. and, and to make that, you know, yeah. round of decisions. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I think that's pretty important. Uh, we, we give it a very thorough going over because we certainly don't want any of our clients to lose any money. No, so. <laughs> um, no absolutely not. And um, uh, we have a question um, from Alan asking, do you buy any boring bonds such as Australian government um, when you think the the market yields might be temporarily too high. I haven't yet, but um, you know that's got to be in the back of your mind as a possibility for the future. So 
because if we are headed for a bit of a downturn, then that'd be the first place to go. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, and we have a comment from Simon. Hello, Simon. It's so nice to um, hear that you're on the line. Um, and he, he just mentions vulnerability. The stock markets are at risk, he's, Simon's saying. A correction would affect higher risk and longer dated bonds, a case for going shorter and less risk. Yes, that is certainly what we're suggesting to our clients at the moment. Uh, shorter dated, uh, lower risk. And that's one of the things I didn't mention as Graham was going through his portfolio. You'll recognise he's got quite a number of bonds in there with different maturity dates. And because he has uh, quite an extensive portfolio with different maturity dates, in any one year, some of the bonds may um, mature. Mm. And so there will be a sort of a liquidity coming back to him. Mm. Uh, yeah. And that's what you do with a shorter dated portfolio. Yeah. If you're uncertain of, of uh, markets and maturities, you do have some rolling off in the next 12 months or um, the next two years, three years. Yeah. Uh, that's quite a, a reasonable strategy to employ. Mm. Uh, and Pat's asked, do you only purchase bonds in $50,000 or do you also uh, buy in smaller den denominations? I've tended not to go below 50, um, but uh, it depends a bit on what you can get too. Um, I know that, that McPherson's one, I think I've only got 20 or 30 of that left yes. after selling some. Yeah. And uh, you know, if, if uh, there's a nice bond and it's only available in a smaller parcel, I'd still be interested. Yes, and yeah. most of them are from ten thousand yeah. dollars. So you can yeah. you can still have a very uh, diversified portfolio with uh, mm. our minimum, okay. which is two hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah. You yeah. could have twenty five bonds of ten thousand yeah. dollars each. Yeah, I might let you keep going. Sorry, okay. we we'll digressed well, a little bit there. No, that's all right. The, the, this is the sort of final bit, the wrap up about what I've learned and how I've done and all that sort of thing. So if we go into that now. Um, this is just a chart that you can get off the FIG website that shows you, you know, the uh, percentage of floating fixed annuities um, and by asset type, senior, sub debt, whatever, um, sector, corporate, financials, property, etc. Um, you can look at that later. Um, the cash flow, the the FIG website gives you your cash flow every month for the next X years, depending on when the last maturity of the bond you've got. So I can know to the dollar uh, how much income I'm going to receive every month next year, every month the year after, as long as I don't buy and sell stuff. Um, and I think that's, that's probably more solid information than I get with equities because if I'm holding you know, the banks or Telstra or BHP or whatever, then I've got an expectation about what the yeah, dividend might be next year, but I don't know for certain. No. Whereas with the bond, I do. Yeah. Um, and I can plan my cash flow because obviously you can see here there are some high months and low months. Now, um, some bonds will pay you back. I don't think I've got any that are just annual. I've got some six monthly, mm -hmm. quarterly, and some monthly. So obviously some got a spawn in one given month and you'll get a lot of money in the door and others uh, it's a bit lean so you have to balance out your cash flow to live on that sort of thing but it's all there for you to see. So how have I done? All right well if we look at the ASX 200 over the last three years um, the last year was pretty good 9.45 but average three years 3.67% um, per year. Uh, not sure equity investors are smiling you know, all that much at the moment. Uh, and my portfolio uh, last year was 10 under 10%, you know, nine point, high, high 9%, so that's fine. So what have I learned? Thought I was just buying a coupon. As I said at the start, I had no idea, and probably you'd say, I want a dance, uh, <laughs> that the bond price was going to change the way it can. I. I I figured that there was a little bit of movement, but I had no idea that uh, we could actually make a little bit of money on the bond price, so I was just buying a coupon. I learned to watch the call dates, because a couple of years ago I was caught asleep. Um, didn't cost me any money, but I thought, oh, how did this happen? Yeah. <laughs> Be aware of market interest rates. Now, everybody out there listening will have their view of what they think the market interest rates are going to, 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 to do. For me personally, I can't see anything changing for a couple of years. But there are various commentators that says, oh, well, next year the RBA is going to put rates up. Uh, 
don't know that I can quite agree with that, but the RBA is smarter than me, so. <laughs> we'll wait and see. <laughs> and don't have favourites, not to withstanding what I said about plenary, because that was certainly a favourite. <clears throat> I like new issues, we've already covered that. I look for companies with stable cash flows. So, um, you know, well covered. In current times, we've talked about this also, looking for shorter dated and, and high yield. Um, talked about that too. So how long are you gonna hold a bond? Well, there are only three options really. You can hold to maturity, receive the coupon interest along the way and the face value comes back at maturity. So you run a risk of interest rate movements over the time. So if the bond is five or 10 years, then what's market interest rates gonna do in that five or 10 years? Um, and the risk of the company fortunes changing. Uh, so again, you know, you've got to manage that as well or monitor that as well, I think. Option two is sell prior to maturity. <clears throat> so you're holding for a period, you can receive the coupon interest along the way sell when you think it's appropriate and hopefully make a little bit of money or maybe a loss. The risk is you sell too soon and the price goes up after you sell. How often have we been in that trap? Or the risk of not being able to achieve the same yield elsewhere. Um, so you're watching that as well. Or third option, you get called and the issuer pays you back, which is happening. Tomorrow. Yes, yes, that's that's right. Is that if they think they can get cheaper funding somewhere else, yeah. or they get taken over, and the company, um, you know, has other funding well, availability. And, exactly, yeah. uh, they they will will repay. Much to our um, our horror, our horror <laughs> at times, especially when there's a good coupon. So considerations: is is it, is that a new issue? Obviously, a par or an existing bond at a premium or a discount. Okay. What type is it? Is it fixed, floating, inflation ring? You know, if it, I, I've got, I think only three floating at the moment because the floating rate notes are not easily available all that much at the moment. No. Uh, it, there's not a plethora of them out there looking for them. Well, with interest rates so low, yeah. the company's natural preference is to issue fixed yeah. because yeah. they think interest rates might go up. They'll take that two or three or four percent. Yeah, and mm. be happy. And be happy, exactly. Um, what's the yield? We know what that is. How long is it for maturity? Yeah. Likely interest rate movement in the time and what might affect this one? And what do I think about the company? You know, what are their prospects? Uh, are they manufacturing fax machines? <laughs> mm, don't no. like that proposition. <laughs> is it rated? Um, a lot of them are not these days. And, and rating is an interesting thing. I think it's more a question of if the company can issue a bond and have it taken up by the market unrated, why are they going to pay money to the rating agencies? They so, don't need to. No. Uh, unless they can, they think they can get it at substantially cheaper um, coupon yeah. than what they would otherwise pay. If it's rated. If yeah. it's rated, yes. Okay. Call dates, how are the market value of it? What risk am I taking? Now we'll talk about risk in a minute. Act, uh, am I being adequately rewarded? Of course, read the research understand the business, all this is obvious stuff. So I already said, you know, last year, uh, nine plus percent, nearly 10. Annualised holding period returns you've seen between about three and 27, typically in the eight to 10% range. And my logic says that's all I need to live on and to cover inflation and hope for better times. Now, um, probably I'm very heavily weighted in bonds at the moment. Mm -hmm. I don't, really expect to stay that way forever. Mm -hmm. I'll be more the Benjamin Graham 50-50 perhaps thing, and I'll get back into equities when I'm comfortable that the equities market has a future. Uh, I don't think it does at the moment. It's very hard <laughs> to find value. It is, it is indeed. So I monitor performance every bond every month. So those spreadsheets, screenshots I showed you, I update those every month with the um, end of month valuation report, fill that in and monitor and see how it's going. We've already said it's active. Um, I've got a watch list. There's a couple of bonds at the moment which um, would be on my sell list when the opportunity comes up. And I turn over the more risky stuff more frequently than the less risky stuff as their fortunes may change. 
Um, my last point really is about this risk we reward curve and everybody would have seen versions of this that show you know the higher the risk the higher the reward should be uh, and you can see bonds there between cash and property and, and safer than shares and less rewarding than shares now back to Benjamin Graham <coughs> Benjamin Graham disagrees with this and says Old and sound principle, those who can't afford to take risks should be happy with low return. And he says that the rate of the return which you should aim for is proportionate to the amount of risk you read around. But Benjamin Graham says, no, our view is different. The rate of return should be dependent on the amount of intelligent effort you put in. Rather than the risk that you're prepared to take, the amount of work you're prepared to do. So the maximum return would be realised by the alert and enterprising investor who exercises maximum intelligence and skill. And there's nothing in there that Ben Graham says about maximum risk. So do the work. Warren Buffett says, investing successfully, you don't need to be super clever, you just need to concentrate. Um, I think the point that I want to leave people with here is that I don't claim to be super clever. There's a lot of people listening today that will be way cleverer than me. Um, my take on this is that I do a fair bit of work and I think it's the work that gets the results rather than the exceptionally high IQ or cleverness. So that's pretty much it from me. Well, there's a, a plethora of questions. So <laughs> let's start with Peter. Peter asks, in the case of bonds, how important is, in your selection process is the issue of repayment or refinance at maturity? I don't, that, that's probably uh, down number 10 or so on my list of things to do. Uh, and I don't usually get to interested in that because I don't really plan to hang around that long. Mm -hmm. if, if a bond is 10 years, then I'm not going to still hold that bond at maturity I, unless you know the whole world turns pear-shaped and I have to. My plan would be not to hold it that long. Um, and a five-year bond, I probably want to be out before the first call date. So <coughs> refinancing risk for the company isn't really on my radar. Maybe it should be. <laughs> oh, I, I, well, you, everyone has their own strategy and yeah. they find what they're comfortable with. Yeah. So, it, you know, roughly 50% of our investors would be held to maturity yeah. and roughly 50% trade. So, right. uh, or active investors like yourself. Yeah. So, Peter also yeah. asked, this is another very good question, what are the main exit signals used for, bo for both um, shares and equity, uh, shares and bonds, beg your pardon? Exit signals for shares and bonds. Well, in my head, they're completely different. Um, if it was equities, let's cover that because it's simple. For me, an exit signal would be completely technical. Um, support and resistance on the chart, um, break of trend and that sort of thing. That would be my exit signal if it was an equity. Um, and that's pretty straightforward and pretty easy. Exit signals for bonds, I suppose if you have a view that the company fortunes may change, then there's a, a subtle sort of exit signal there perhaps. But I think the exit signal for me on bonds is, is there a call approaching and is the current market value higher than the call value? Then that's an exit signal. Um, I'm not too sure that there are many other, you know, straightforward exit signals for bonds. The company fortunes and the approaching call. Probably. Possibly if you had a view on interest rates and oh, you yes. were holding a fixed rate bond yeah. or you had, <clears throat> you know, you wanted to go floating to move to floating or vice versa or, um, yeah, you know, a tail risk inflation, mm. <laughs> a mm. nasty inflation sting. Mm. That might be another one. Um, lots of other questions here. Russell's asked this lovely question, have you ever made a loss on a bond? Oh yeah, um, I, not, not in the last couple of years, so they didn't figure in today's presentation, but uh, 
Oh, well, there was one there, which was the US one. Uh, the the losses on, on I mean, I've, I've got one or two where there might have been $100 or something. Mm -hmm. So small. Um, really small. But uh, the, those um, US ones, I mean, there were that uh, Newcastle coal infrastructure, I think it was about a $9,000 loss, which was currency. Yes. Um, so, yes, I've made a loss. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And hopefully I learned something. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so a number of other questions here, and I'm just going to run through them. Uh, do you outperform the bond indices or the bond funds? Have you ever compared your portfolio no, to those? I haven't. I can tell you that you would outperform, right? Oh, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the particularly the bond funds. So right. the bond funds uh, we find, and in a low interest rate environment they're still taking the management fees. Right. So they typically underperform the indices nearly nearly all the time. I think something like 75% of managed bond funds underperform their benchmarks. So mm. hard, very hard to yeah. Uh, yeah. to pick a winner. Yeah. Um, in terms of the indices, it's your Australian high yield predominantly, your portfolio. Yes. There, there is uh, only just... Um, there is an Australian high yield index, but it's not very old. It's quite a young in index uh, yeah. because it's not a very developed market okay. and mm -hmm. figure yeah. at the forefront of the market. Right. Uh, there are other issuers. NAB's issued a couple. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's, a, there's a few other issuers there. And um, John asked, do you prefer fixed or floating rate bonds? Do you have any preference there? Um, I, I think it uh, really depends on the times. And I think sort of in the near future, maybe in the next six months, I'll start to look for some more floating rate bonds. Because obviously, as the, although I don't think interest rates are going to increase anytime soon, ultimately they will. Mm, yes. Um, and one would need to move into floating, but uh, the problem is the supply at the moment. That's very true. We're really <laughs> chasing uh, hard for, uh, for bonds and uh, if you, are interested in any, um, you may be waitlisted for them because yeah. they're, they're just, there isn't the issuance we would, would like. And uh, sorry, I forget, I've forgotten the gentleman that asked, but someone did ask, you know, do we expect any new issues of inflation linked bonds? Uh, not at this stage, we don't. Um, and certainly we would hope that FIG will, with FIG originated bonds, continue to issue roughly one a month. Uh, there'll be a quiet period leading into Christmas yeah. and January, but otherwise roughly one a month mm. we would uh, hope hope to issue. Mm. Uh, but there has been record, record issuance of bonds this year in the um, uh, institutional over-the-counter market, but um, demand has been significant from uh, Australian investors as well as Asian private buyers and Canadian yeah. super funds. It's very much a global market and there is... A lot of cash out there looking for a, a home and bonds are one of the favoured places because you do have that uh, that, that um, certainty that if the company or the entity survives, you get your capital back. Yeah. So it's the game sort of has become yeah. a bit more about capital preservation rather than high returns. Yeah, and that's probably about where it should be too. Um, I'm obviously aware that internationally the corporate bond market is way, way bigger than the equities market, mm -hmm. and yet in Australia it's minuscule. Um, so hopefully we'll catch up uh, at some point. We sure hope that that's true. Uh, a couple of other questions. Alan's asked: Is there a lack of is the lack of franking credits a concern when holding such a large bond weighting? I think the franking is always part of your return calculation. So if you're looking at equities, uh, particularly if it's a self-managed fund like ours is in pension mode, then the franking comes straight back as cash, if you like. So that's part of the income received. That's obviously part of the calculation. You're looking, all right, well, if I'm getting X uh, equities return, including the franking, Y return from bonds, um, you're looking at the total return. So franking's part of that, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Tony asks, um, if he doesn't have equities in his self-managed super fund, what's the maximum percentage of your portfolio that should be invested in corporate bonds? So no equities, how much? <clears throat> how many corporate bonds should you earn? Do you want to have a go at that well, one? Well, I'm just going to go back to Benjamin Graham because I can't, um, 
offer any more insight than his. He, he says 75% bonds and 25% equities at this time in the cycle. Um, confess that my bond portfolio is a little bit more than 75%, not a huge amount, but a little bit more than that. Um, but Ben Graham says that's the maximum, so, you know. Um. Yes, yeah. It's, um, I think it just goes to show that really well-known um, global investors recognise the need for investors to hold an allocation to bonds. Mm. Uh, and uh, Warren Buffett's the same. Yep. He he follows the Ben Graham 75, 25%. Yep. And in fact, he uh, not that long ago said to his wife, when I die, make sure 10% of everything we hold is in government bonds, US government bonds. So imagine that amount, 10% of his entire value. Well, well, we're, well, that's a lot of money. So, is there a government that's issued that much? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, but I think that's, uh, you know, that's one of the major points for me in this asset class that it is it is generally low risk and defensive and protective but you can um, make it work and you can get better returns than mm. what your um, what is shown up front and um, let me just say with Graham's portfolio and I should make this point it is a high yield portfolio and he works hard to, to get those returns. It's not a set and forget and I know, have known Graham for years and I know he follows those names uh, closely and he reads the research in, in the wire, yep. uh, the new, the weekly newsletter. Um, so if you are interested in becoming uh, a FIG client and interested in our um, high yield bonds, uh, please make sure you do read the research and under, understand the risks. Uh, our minimum uh, investment now to become a FIG client is $250,000. It has increased um, this year from a, a smaller amount, uh, but we found our business is a, a we give a, a nice level of service, I think. We talk to our clients, mm, you can yeah. talk to the analysts. We have events like today. We um, produce a lot of education and, and research and um, we want to have that relationship with our clients. and. To have smaller clients, or, you know, smaller vo volumes, um, more clients with smaller volumes, it just wasn't, it, it wasn't really working. So, um, uh, again, um, we're here. We would love to talk to you. Um, very happy to talk you through um, possible portfolios uh, that are available. There are some now available available on the website. If you go on to fig.com.au. There are portfolio samples there, so you can get an idea of um, what bonds are available at what what returns. Um, I'm going to try and sum up, Graham. Do you want to have a, any last word or any last piece of? Um, no, I won't I, say advice. General no, advice. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I just want to make the point that mm. it, it, everybody out there shouldn't thinking that I'm super smart or anything like that. It, it, as I said, there's a lot of people out there at least as smart as me and most smarter. Uh, and I think if, if people are prepared to um, do the research, put in the work and the study and whatever, um, then they can do pretty well. Thank you very yeah. much. I um, <coughs> just want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's been a delight to have Graham mm -hmm. along. I hope you've enjoyed his presentation. When I saw it at the Australian Investors Association, the national conference, um, it was a different way of looking and thinking about how to get into bonds, which mm. I particularly liked, and um, your very frank way of, uh, and very, thank you for being so open and sharing with us yeah. your returns and your, your thinking. Um, and I hope that's, help, that's helped you. Uh, we are all here, there's a lot of experts in FIG, happy to talk to you at any time. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. This now concludes the uh, afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Thanks everyone. Lovely. So the old boys turn us off. Okay.